All right, so let's talk about topological products. This is lecture nine, based on section 3.6 of Manetti. So uh, given a pair of topological spaces, we want to talk about how to create um, another, another topology for the Cartesian product of those spaces, all right? And so um, <clears throat> a lot of this has to do with the projection maps, which I call pi one and pi two, Minetti calls them little p and little q, but um, I'm going to call them pi 1 and pi 2. They're defined, of course, by just taking the first component or the second component of the pair, right? And um, so the product topology, he defines it as it's the coarsest topology amongst those topologies <laughs> which make pi 1 and pi 2 continuous. Um, okay, I mean... That is, I guess, I suppose that is a, a way you can define it. He explains that that makes sense because um, there, um, well, he, he, uh, <clears throat> he produces, you know, an example of a topology. So he shows that there's at least one. So you can look at all possible topologies on the product and pick the one which is the coarsest amongst those. Um, and simultaneously makes pi 1 and pi 2 continuous. Um, now, I'm personally not really a lover of such definitions, um, but anyway, it's, it's some people like these sort of definitions, so we'll I'm not going to rebel too much against it, but this theorem here actually contains, I believe, an alternate definition essentially, because, well anyway, here it is. Subsets U cross V, where U is open in P and V is open in Q, form a basis known as the canonical basis in the, of the product topology. So looking at this from a different perspective, you could define the, topo the product topology to be the topology generated by this, um, these, these canonical basis sets, right? And so you could then dispense with this coarsest Topology, which maintains the continuity of the projection maps definition if you wanted to. But anyway, I'm trying to be a good sport and play along here. So um, the projections pi 1 and pi 2 are open maps, and for any pair x, y, and p cross q, the restrictions of pi 1 to p cross y goes to p, and pi 2 from x cross q to q are homeomorphisms. And um, let me again, again complain that I really think a different symbol should be used for the restrictions than the maps. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe you should... I mean, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm um, sort of tempted to put a tilde over pi 1 and pi 2 here just to emphasize that it's not the same map as pi 1 and pi 2. As we'll discuss by the end of this lecture, pi 1 and pi 2 are not open <laughs> maps. It's only the restriction that's an open map. Um, anyway, and then finally, uh, continuity of a mapping into the Cartesian product of P and Q uh, can be judged by looking at the continuity of the component functions, F1 pi 1 composed with F and F2 pi 2 composed with F. All right, so proof of one here. Let P be the, let me see if I'm in frame. I think I am, but I'm a, I guess we'll be okay. I'm not. Yeah, let me tell you. So I'm sure I'm in frame. There we go. Can I get? Eh. Well, anyway, I'll make do with it like this. So let P be the product topology. Notice that the collection of subsets U cross V, where U is open in P and V is open in U, satisfy the conditions of theorem 3.7, in part because of this identity. If you take the intersection of the Cartesian product of u1 and v1 and u2 with v2, you get the intersection of u1 with u2 and Cartesian product with v1 intersect v2. So that it follows then that such subjects form a basis for the topology uh, of, of the Cartesian product p and q. And we call that topology t for now. We're calling the product topology p. Our goal in number one is to show p equals to t. All right. <clears throat> so anyway. Since the inverse image of u under pi 1 is u cross q, and the inverse image of v under pi 2 is p cross v, um, for any open u and v, that means that pi 1 and pi 2 are continuous with respect to the t topology. All right. 
And so that means that P must be coarser than T, of course, because that was the definition. But on the flip side of things, if you notice P, U is a subset of P, V is a subset of Q open, it gives the Cartesian product of U and V to be the, of course, the intersection of the inverse image of U with the inverse image of V. Um, if you don't believe that, just take a piece of paper, write it out, you'll see it, okay? Um, and so, of course, this is an element, This, since this is equal to that, that's in the product topology, right? Which means that any open set in T is a union of um, open sets in the product topology. I think, well, I think it's actually just an open... Well, anyway, so that implies that... <clears throat> excuse me, T is coarser than P. Which, of course, then, if they're, one is coarser than the other and the other is coarser than the one, that means that they're the same topology. But, yep. All right, let's move on here. Two, if we observe that, if we take U cross V, oh, come on, paper, behave. If we take U cross V, intersect with the P Cartesian product with a singleton Y. Um, if you think about how that works, that's either going to be, so P, U is a subset of P, so U intersect P is just U again. Likewise, down here, V intersect Q is just V again. So really, the only question is, is Y an element of V? See, if Y is an element of V, then you're just left with Y. But if Y is not an element of V, then, the, uh, then this intersection is empty. And likewise, down here, Either x is in u, in which case the intersection of u and x is just the singleton x, and otherwise the intersection of u and x is the empty set, and that means the whole thing is the empty set. Anyway, so this allows us to understand the subspace topologies of p cross a singleton or the singleton cross q. Notice that the projection maps um, from p cross y to p or you know pi two x cross q to q. They're clearly bijections, and if u is open sub, if u is open in p, then pi inverse of u is this, which is open, um, which is open, of course, as we just discussed up here, and um, therefore the inverse image of open is open, which means pi one is continuous, and likewise for pi two. In terms of why are these open maps, we'll notice that pi 1 of the empty set and pi 2 of the empty set is the empty set, so that's that. And then the other kind of sets, <coughs> excuse me, like u cross y, um, well, that, that, that maps to u, and this cross x cross v maps to v, so it follows that pi 1 and pi 2 are open maps. <coughs> Again, technically not really pi 1 and pi 2, I'm talking about pi 1 restricted to the singleton cross p or the singleton cross q, p crossing, p cross the singleton containing y or the singleton containing x cross q. Mm, okay, so I seem to be congested. I was trying to find a hard drive in a box downstairs and I was not successful. I was successful in opening many boxes and kicking up a lot of dust, but that seems to be about it. Um, <laughs> Still haven't found my hard drive. Very annoying. I, I strongly advise not moving. Let's see here. Anyway, um, so if we have a continuous map, then the component functions are composition of the continuous projection and the continuous function which is given, and hence they're continuous. And so conversely, if we have f1 is that and f2 is that are continuous, and um, we look at u cross v open and p cross q, then um, I said notice this. I don't think I actually used that. Let me not notice. I was going to cross that out. I was thinking I'd go that path. I was thinking I was going to go down that, that path there, but actually in the end I went a different way. So, yes. Come on, come on, come on, there we go. All right, so let's look at the inverse image of um, u cross v, right? Now this is a, <laughs> to me this is a ginormous jump, all right? 
So what I'm going to, basically I'm going to um, show you through these steps that in fact this is the inverse image of u cross v, but it's going to take me a few steps, all right? So start with this. This is a claim, okay? I don't think that's at all clear. I mean, maybe it's clear if you know more, but or if you're used to this stuff, but it's, it's, I don't think it's clear to people who don't know anything. Um, anyway, so, um, all right, so first of all, um, pi 1 composed with, I say that this is the same as pi 1 composed with f inverse of u, and you know, here I'm just putting in the definition of f1 and f2. Then I use the sock shoes principle for the inverse image, so this is f inverse composed with pi 1 inverse of u, and f inverse composed of pi inverse, pi 2 inverse of v. But um, then, all right, the inverse image of pi 1 on, of u is actually u cross q, all right? These are not the restricted pi 1 and pi 2. These are the, these, these are the whole maps, all right? So keep in mind, the use of pi 1 and pi 2 in part 3 is not the same as the use of pi 1 and pi 2 in part 2. These are actually different maps. They have a different domain. Restricted pi 1 and pi 2 in part 2, unrestricted pi 1 and pi 2 down here. Um, unrestricted pi 1's inverse image of u is u cross q. Unrestricted, unrestricted inverse image of pi 2 of v is p cross v. And so you got u cross f inverse of u cross q intersect with f inverse of p cross v, at which point I decided, oh, I should really look at what that means. So that's x in the domain such that f of x is an element of the Cartesian product of u and q x in the domain such that f of x is a Cartesian product is an element of the Cartesian product of um, p cross v. But what's that mean? That means f of x is in this and in that, which is just the only way that can happen is if it's in the Cartesian product of u and v. But this is exactly that. That's the inverse image of u cross v. So that is why this is equal to this. So, and um, let's see here, punchline. We we're trying to prove what that. Um, that the mapping was continuous if and only if the components were component maps were continuous. So here we are working on, we're supposing that the component maps were continuous. And so if the component maps are continuous, notice that we get, so like this is the intersection of open sets because this F1 and F2 are continuous. So the inverse image of open U and inverse image of open V are both open, and the intersection of two open sets is open, and hence the inverse image under F of U cross V is in fact this open set. So that proves continuity of F. And there you have it. Yup. Three. This is a relatively short section, and uh, <laughs> it could be made much longer. If you look at Munkrees, topology book. Um, he has discussion of other concepts of topology on products, and um, it can get trickier. Um, so this is like one concept of the product topology, but I believe there's something else called the, um, if memory serves me, the box topology, which I don't think we have any discussion of in here. I don't know if Manetti comes back to the box topology later in the book or not, I can't remember. But if you want to see more on the product topology and, and how to make it worse, you can, you can look at, look at Munkries on this. Um, anyway, the product topology on n, uh, n copies of a, uh, well, not, they don't have to be the same thing, but n topological spaces, P1 through Pn, it's defined to be the coarsest amongst the topologies on the Cartesian product of these, these n sets, which makes pi 1 through pi n uh, continuous where I think you know what I mean by pi 1 through pi n, right? Pi 1 of a n tuple just picks off the first m element of the tuple, like pi 2 is a mapping from the Cartesian product to all these guys just to p2 and so forth, right? So the natural extension of my pi 1 and pi 2 to the n-fold product. Moreover, the canonical basis of the product topology is given by just this Cartesian product of, of open sets in the, um, in the topology. Anyway, so for example, the Euclidean topology for Rn coincides with the product topology for n copies of R. So you can think of this as R cross R cross R n full times. And um, 
you can build a canonical basis for Rn by just taking like a Cartesian problem. Now that I will say it probably like if you're thinking about open balls in terms of the Euclidean topology, the basic open sets are open balls, right? Well, I mean, if we make n equals to three, it's literally a ball, right? If we think about n equals to three, and you think about the basic open sets being um, open intervals in the, um, the in the Euclidean topology, right? Those are the one-dimensional open balls. Well, then the Cartesian product of open intervals is not an open ball, right? It's actually an open cube or open uh, rectangular rectangloid. I don't know what you want to call the thing. Um, parallel pipehead, but um, so. But anyway, those those are equivalent topologies, but the one you build with spheres versus the one you build with cubes, same, same thing, but um, anyway, that's interesting. And um, finally, last claim, um, which I think serves to um, drive home my complaint about using pi one for both maps here. <laughs> um, the unrestricted pi one from R2 to R, defined of course as pi one of xy is equal to x, is not a closed map. And I, I like this example that we're about to look at here a lot. It's got, it's got a lot of the uh, things we've built up here in this course already and kind of put them together a little bit. Um, so if you consider the hyperbola, um, which would be x comma y such that xy equals to one, that's a subset of R2, right? It's in fact the zero set of the function xy minus one. And it should be fairly obvious that that's a continuous function on the plane, right? And so since zero is a closed set and this is a continuous function, the inverse image of a closed set is closed, but the inverse image of this closed singleton zero is actually the hyperbola. And what that means then is that the hyperbola is a closed subset of R2, all right? And so that's kind of um, a generic truth. Uh, if you think about a, a level curve in R2, it's gonna be a closed set. Um, because you can think of it as the inverse image of, of the, like the level curve of the level map in this way. But anyway, so that's a closed subset. But if you look at pi one of the hyperbola, what happens? Well, if you think about the way that looks, it's, you know, um, what does it look like? I guess I can add a picture. Do, 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 do. So the hyperbola, here's my x, here's my y, and the hyperbola, sometimes call this thing the, well, I don't know what I call it. This is the reciprocal map though. So it's, it's one of these guys and one of those guys, all right. So I was just showing my college algebra students this in the form y equals one over x is the way we usually think about it in college algebra. But as you can see, when you look at the projection onto the x-axis of that thing, right, the one thing that's not covered is zero, right? So pi one of the hyperbola is everything except for zero, but that's the union of open sets, which is open. So this mapping, this continuous mapping maps this closed set to that open set and there you go it's not an open map and I also think you know hey by the way if you want an example of a map which is continuous but not open this is a you know pretty nice example um, I should remember it for when students ask me anyway as I was saying I am not a fan of Minetti's lack of notation for pi 1 restricted versus pi 1 unrestricted there should be some notation used as there is certainly a potential for confusion here. Anyway, enough confusion for today. Actually, one more lecture to go. So, thanks guys.